Hi, this is Abelardo de la Peña Jr., Director of Marketing and Communications with La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, welcoming all of you to Encanta con la Plaza. A special night. Every other Friday, we have with us Dan Guerrero Happy Hour. But before we get to the conversation, let me tell you a little bit of what's going on at La Plaza. We are open. We've been open now for about a month and a half from Wednesday through Monday from 12 to 5. Our tienda is open as well. Free admission. We just require that you wear a mask. This weekend we will be short on we will be closed on Mon on Sunday and on Monday because of uh, the holiday, but then we welcome you back on Wednesday with uh, the ability to see all our exhibitions, including uh, a couple of really special ones. Also, if you're out and about this weekend, day or night, you could come by and check out the exhibit "Only Light Can Do That." by Patrick Martinez. It's a new neon art mural covering our windows uh, there at La Plaza overlooking Main Street. So day and night, you'll see some beautiful social justice messages. And then finally, um, let's see, our public programming starts soon. And we'll talk a little bit about it when we bring up our, our, our host with the most. Also, uh, let's see, if you're on Zoom, please let us know where you're viewing from right there in the comment section that you're coming in from El Centro, California, with your wherever. We just want to know where everybody's zooming in from. Those of you on Facebook as well, use the comment section to uh, let us know where you're viewing from. You can make comments. You could ask questions. We'll probably take them later on. We also have that Q&A feature there on Zoom that everybody loves. All right. Well, with that, let's uh, bring up the man of the hour, hour and a half, Dan Guerrero. Welcome, Dan. Unmute, please. Unmute, please. Can you hear me? I, I did that first, but too quickly. <laughs> People have been trying to mute me for years. It does not work. So just know that. <laughs> it's the truth. Oh, my God. You know, I had the air on, but it seemed noisy and started to get cold. So I turned it off. And of course, now I'm warm. So I'm, I'm just a mess tonight. So it's going to be a terrific program. Well, well, let's start off with a little toast. A little to toast to our guest tonight, who is unbelievable, but we'll talk to her uh, in a minute. What's going on over there at La Plaza? Lots of things as always, right? Well, yeah, to start off, of course, our museum is open. And then our public programming starts on July 17th. And we have a, a fabulous uh, presentation there. It's a documentary screening of somebody I think you knew. It's called Carlos Almaraz, Playing with Fire. It's a documentary which was produced and, and released in 2019. And we have a panel uh, previous to the screening. So, and, and who's moderating the panel, Dan? Me. I moderated it. The documentary, I don't know if you've seen the documentary. I don't know if you've all seen the documentary, Playing with Fire. It's absolutely sensational. It was directed by uh, his, his uh, I hate saying widow, but that's what she is, uh, uh, Elsa Flores Almaraz and um, our, our friend Richard Montoya. And it's absolutely amazing. Uh, I've seen it three times. And each time I, I learned something more about Carlos. And I thought I knew everything about him since we knew each other since grade school. And here, here's the proof. Thrifty Drugstore, Whittier Boulevard, <laughs> Carlos and me. But um, the documentary is great. And we're going to have a wonderful panel before with uh, Barbara Carrasco, John Valadez. I think Frank Romero and Elsa are zooming in. Um, but it's, uh, it will, there'll be a reception panel and then the screening. So it's going to be a great night. It really is. Yes. So it will and it's free of charge uh, come on in doors open at six o'clock at seven o'clock we have a band playing uh the sacred souls out of san diego is playing some chicano oldies uh, and then the panel and then the screen and dan will be there so dan is here now so i'm gonna go away dan we'll see you in a little while okay i'll see you in a bit okay well I, you know i'm a little concerned how we're going to squeeze everything in in a, in a one hour, uh, approximately one hour Zoom on tonight's guest who was the, had the most amazing career and life and is still doing it. So we're gonna have to talk really, really, really fast to get it all in. <clears throat> I have a quote actually, uh, that's gonna kick it off from uh, our guest. It was a straight arrow from kindergarten to university and the arts, drawing and painting was the thing. It was always that. 
And I say that because she is indeed an artist, activist, educator, long time, very revered professor at UCLA, both in the uh, World Arts and Cultures Department and the Cesar E. Chavez Department of Chicana, Chicano Studies. Um, but we're going to take our cue from that quote and we're gonna concentrate and focus on her art to, tonight. So it's gonna be a wonderful journey. And so zooming in directly from the canals of Venice, California, but still Venice, zoom in. Judith Francisca Baca, how are you? I'm fine and it's nice to see you. It's always nice to see you, Miha, and you have that gorgeous home on the canal there. You've worked hard for it, and I know you enjoy it tremendously. Well, I have, a, as I say, I always have a cousin for something, and my cousins built this house for me. Ah, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful retreat is really what it is. So you are flying so high these days, my God, the restoration of your um, incredible mural hitting the wall was just last week. It was on the news everywhere. That was an historic event. And also, of course, you have a retrospective opening later this month at the Museum of Latin American Art, MOLA in, in Long Beach. So you are on fire. You are on fire. How are you feeling about all that? Good, obviously. Uh, it's, a, it's a little overwhelming. I think it's like to be discovered at this late point in my life. <laughs> I've been here forever, you know, but fine. I'm happy whenever people could get a chance to see the work and the restoration is in progress still. So people can watch it as she uh, peers out of the paint, the paint over. And it's a great victory for artists because the paint over is very common in LA and the, the loss of our murals and to get it back is a victory. I, and I want to talk about that in a minute. I don't know if you remember when I called you coming back from Philadelphia a few years ago, and we're going to talk about that very thing. But I, I also want to say that uh, we're going to talk about, obviously, the MOLA retrospective, which is a big deal. They're also honoring you in November, and we're so lucky to have the uh, president and CEO, the wonderful uh, Dr. Lourdes Ramos Rivas with us. She's going to be joining us to talk about the exhibition a little later on. Uh, and she is the first Latina, first Latina to ever hold that post in the in the museum's 20 years history. So that that's an ex, ex, extra good thing here. Let's talk about the mural now. Uh, you did it for the Olympics, well, not 84, right? Olympics. Yeah. And and it was washed over. You'll tell us why. And I don't even want to get into, but we will a little bit on what it took to restore it is still going on. But tell us. Tell us about it, where it is, and and uh, why it was painted over in the first place. Hitting the wall. It's called hitting the wall. It's it's called uh, hitting the wall. Women in the marathon, and it was painted in commemoration in 1984 of the very first time women were allowed to run in the marathon. So up until that time, women tried to run, but they were tackled and taken out and never allowed to compete. So it was as late as 84 that women were able for the first time to run. So that's the content of my piece. But there were 10 of us that painted for the, um, the great, uh, for the, the Olympics. I remember uh, that. We, we have some photos of hitting the wall. Can we see those, Abelardo? This, this was just last week. Now, where is it located, Judy? Um, it's um, right off the, the Harbor Freeway, the 110, um, at the 4th Street exit. So if you're going to go to the Music Center, you'd be taking the off-ramp. Uh, alongside of hitting the wall of women in the marathon. And you see her here just coming up through the paint. The paint over is multiple layers uh, put on by Caltrans and by Metro uh, in an attempt to clean up graffiti. So and and they would permission from who? Did they just do it? I mean, somebody had to okay it. Yeah, you know, what's crazy is that none of, everybody says they didn't okay it, but it is in fact their contractors that do it. Nobody wanted to take responsibility for it. And the big issue was, of course, we, uh, in a sense, like a little spider, I was waiting. I was waiting <laughs> for them to paint over my piece. So they painted over so many of the other pieces of the, by the other Olympic muralists. Um, I was waiting for them not to give me notification because then they would violate my law, the rights I have as uh, the Visual Artist Rights Act or uh, the California um, Preservation Act. Of, so, Indeed they did, and they were trying to, they, they hate the graffiti so much that they would paint over and lose the mural 
to make the, the graffiti disappear. So rather than remove the, the graffiti, uh, they painted over it and they did it multiple times. So the layers and layers of paint over that piece is just remarkable. I mean, as it's coming off, I'm, it's like a miracle because we put a coating on it and this mural coating is so amazing that we can remove all the paint to the coating and the mural is preserved underneath. So this is a, an invention of Spark, the, the Social and Public Art Resource Center and um, my team out there who is just doing a remarkable job. There's, there's about uh, 10 people who are risking their lives at the moment, pulling her back into, the, into being. So I got to stand there and watch her head come back through the-, the Now it had, we're gonna talk about Spark as well. We have a lot to talk about, but let me ask you this. It had to have been emotional, personally emotional to see her come to life again. That had to be a moment for you. It was truly a, mo a moment. And I think uh, for a number of reasons, not just because it's a mural that I labored over nine months on the Harbor Freeway, which is an insane thing to do. I mean, I think every artist who went out into that freeway and painted before the Olympics was insane. And <laughs> we certainly- I can vouch for Frank Romero, by the way, so go on. <laughs> well, John Worley, uh, um, you know, uh, Willie Heron, uh, yeah. Roderick Sykes, I mean, uh, uh, Terry Schoenhaven, they were wonderful muralists. Uh, all uh, um, Glenna Boltek, all of us who went out there and did those that work for so long in that terrible, con those terrible conditions were crazy. And we wanted to present Los Angeles in this light as a muralist city. And at that point, we had a legacy of murals all over the city. And we wanted people to come internationally and see what had be, been done primarily in communities of color uh, and primarily uh, out of cultural representation that is not the mainstream representation. So um, uh, Bob uh, Fitzpatrick, who was the president of Cal Arts at the time, proposed that we paint on the freeway. And of course I told him he was crazy. I said, <laughs> we don't need to be painting in the freeway, give us other walls. And uh, he insisted that it be on the freeway. And we were rushing to meet June, the opening of the Olympics. And it, it was a remarkable experience because that Olympics when women ran the first time, it's yeah. just, it was an unforgettable moment uh, when uh, the, the, the victorious marathoners uh, came running around that final lap, right? Your, your calling uh, uh, LA a muralist city gets me back to the Philadelphia story. I, I, hey, Phil, that was with Catherine Hepburn, but this is different Philadelphia story. <laughs> I was there doing a gig and I was blown away by the murals. I mean, the most beautiful, beautiful work, not a stitch of graffiti, pristine everywhere. I, I, I couldn't believe it. Everywhere I looked was a magnificent mural. And I called you when I came back. I said, I thought LA was the capital, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, the city of murals in this country. And you said that you gave me the figure for what the city of Philadelphia gave for public work public art and what LA does and how even the people there would never dream of defacing it and what we do. Tell us about what's that about? Well, it has, it really, uh, you know, Jane Golden actually got her start in my, on my program, you know, our Spark program or the first citywide mural program. She did her first mural with us. So she was trained with us and she went to Philadelphia and she imagined a program very much like the one we were running here uh, but she was able to get full city support and the support from, and she started in the rec and parks departments like the program I began did, um, but they, are, they came forward with real dollars and real commitment to support that work. And Los Angeles essentially abandoned the murals, uh, did not prov provide monies for maintenance. And because of the policies that we created, we lost probably, I would guess around 60% of the Los Angeles legacy of murals. Wow. So imagine this is the worst part of the story, the losing all of that work over a whole lifetime of work, something Spark will be in its 45th year this year. And- uh, What year already? 45. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. That means I've been painting murals at least that long, right? And, uh, you know, with a real commitment to you know, putting these public works on the street. so. Yes, we, we lost um, the kind of will as a city. We lost the, the commitment to this, these works. And I think for a lot of reasons, 
um, you know, the lack of foresight of our, our leaders, um, the lack of commitment within the arts for artists that came out of these communities, uh, um, the unwillingness to, you know, do what it took to actually organize in ways that engaged the community and made these works completely relevant to the people who live there. I, I, I write about murals and, and one of the things that I've said so many times is that a mural is not an easel painting made large. It's a work made in relatedness and relatedness to the people who live in the place, to the architecture on which it's painted and to the people. And that makes a real mural. And this comes out of a tradition that is the Mexican tradition of the 20th century. And uh, those are the models that we have. Of course, muralism go back to cave painting, right? Goes probably the earliest art form ever was a, was sure. a mural, right? Sure. But in the 20th century, we were totally inspired in Los Angeles by Los Tres Grandes. And look what we did to see Cato's talk about whitewash. Yes. But you had a very uh, prophetic uh, quote. I love quoting people because they get all nervous. They go, oh my God, what did I say? And when was that? You know, nowadays <laughs> they'll quote you from when you were nine years old, you know. But I like this quote because it was quite prophetic. Um, when you were very young, you wanted to make art. Always you wanted to make art. But you want to make art for the people that you loved. And here was your issue. I thought to myself, if I get my work into galleries, who will go there? People in my family, my neighbors, they haven't ever been to a gallery in their entire lives. It didn't make sense to me at the time to put art behind some guarded wall. Yes, so that sets the tone for you doing it outside, <laughs> yes? Well, yes, and all, you have to add to that that even though I graduated uh, in the arts from the university and got my master's degree and- At CSUN. Know, yeah, CSUN. yeah, CSUN, took tons of art history. I had never seen a Mexican woman artist. In fact, I'd seen very few women artists. So in the early seventies, when I graduated, I, I didn't have a repertoire of people to follow as models. We, we had just, in fact, uh, Frida Kahlo had not been revived by the Chicanas in San Francisco as yet, right? Right, who right. Did that, who did that work? Right. Um, so I couldn't say, oh, I want to be like her or her. Or it was like, well, there's no real place for me. So where, where do I belong as an artist? What can I do? And of course, I walked out of the university in the middle of the movimiento. And that was the time for civil rights. So I thought, okay. So these, art, these hands of an artist should be put into the service of creating social change. After CSUN, you went to, Mex Mex to Cuernavaca to the Taller Cigueros, right? Yes, I was in the what, what that must. How did that jive with what you'd been taught and what you were learning at Cal State Northridge and in Mexico with Los Tres Grandes and there, how that had to be an enormous shift in your thinking, I would think. Yes, well, it was because, well, it, but in, in, uh, in, in truth, Northridge did not teach me to be a muralist. Um, there was no mural courses as, as there still are not mural courses in most universities in the country. We still, you couldn't still sign up, let's say at UCLA and get a course in muralism or be trained in, in muralism. What I got out of Northridge was my teaching uh, credentials and my understanding of how to work with at-risk youth, which is what I would, my mother said, you can be an artist, but you better be able to get a job. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Mamas, you know, they know. They know. I know. So if you're going to do this, you better get a, find a way to get a job. So I sort of, I, I took up teaching, but which I loved actually, and I still love. I, so when I went to the uh, the Tayera and to the Tayer um, to study, I was one of 26 students, all men. They were all men. You were the only woman there? Yes, the only one. And um, some of the Chicanas from the Southwest, from Texas had come. So we were all there together. And what I learned there, there was people coming in from all over the world. This was a, in 1977. So the, there was all this upheaval in, in Chile. And so the Chilean muralists were there because they were being murdered. and. Um, you know, the poets came and there were Russian muralists. And so I was in this rooms with people who were doing this work 
And I had just begun really in, in, in 77, I had started the Great Wall in 76 and I started working in East Los Angeles in the early seventies. But when I got there, I started listening to people talking about what they were doing. And I started to learn the geometric division of space, a kind of formal treatment of how to make um, composition the way Siqueiros did and his dynamic notions of polyangular theory and uh, um, you know the punto de oro system, a very sophisticated understanding about how to work in relationship to the viewer, you know, how to make something that was dynamic and magnificent and would, as he, as he wanted to do, grab the viewer by the solar plexus and drag him into the piece. So it wasn't like a static person looking at a static frame within your, within your vision, but instead it was something that actually created a relationship that was visceral between the viewer and the, and the artwork. It was like a living thing. It was a living thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And I so love that. And I was so bad at it. <laughs> I, took, I, was like, <laughs> I really didn't understand. I was terrible at math, you know, and I really, I did badly in geometry. And there I was trying to, with my protractor and all of that, trying to learn all of this. And literally, um, it took me a while to really understand this methodology, which I think today I can say, I know and I understand. I'll say, I think you did. <laughs> you mentioned briefly, but you actually did start the first citywide mural program here in Los Angeles in 1970, right? Well, actually, yes, I started the first East Los Angeles mural program in the early 70s. I was the director of East Los Angeles murals. But in 74, I went before the city council with an impassioned plea in my 20s. And really, I didn't even... I had no clue what I was doing or what I was what I was talking about here. I'm just saying, look at my kids need to be paid and we need paint and can we have some scaffolding? And you know, I had been painting in every murals, but I, the city council voted to give me the first monies, and I didn't even know they had voted. <laughs> That's how naive it was. I didn't know the scoreboard. Somebody said they started poking me. They said, Judy, you won. I said, what did I win? I mean, like, I, <laughs> there it was. I was suddenly in charge of a citywide mural project in 1974. And you did everything from the ground up, meaning you 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 decided where they were going to go, the design, you designed them, then you had to get people to paint them, which included gang members and the community members. Tell but us I, all about that. that uh, <clears throat> for not knowing what you were doing, you were doing very well. <laughs> I, I was just, listen, there was more passion than intelligence, okay? There was like, <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Careers have been made that way, so don't worry about it. I think, you know, as a young person, that's really what drives you, right? I, the first Citywide Mural Program was really not me designing all of the works. It was me creating the possibility of artists in each of their communities to design a piece. And then we would hire, as I was working for the city of Los Angeles, I would hire all their kids. I mean, they would, they'd come in with people they wanted to have on their team and I would hire them. They just had to pass a tuberculosis test. The, the, biggest, the biggest problem I had was busing kids out of the inner city for tuberculosis tests. And then I'd get them on a, a rec and parks uh, um, uh, job and then they could work for the artist and the artist got a small stipend and my gang members and young people that I'd work with in the East side went around in our van and handed out scaffolding and paint. And it was kind of glorious. There was no approval system. We didn't have to go to, you know, the commissions and, you know, get permits and, wow. you know, we, we just had to have the community. And that's what was the major proliferation in a very few years. Uh, I supervised over 400 murals. And how many still exist? Not that many uh, of those. I mean, I would say of the first citywide mural pro program, um, I, we haven't actually counted them, but a small percentage. But again, it was revived in 1988, in which Mayor Bradley came back and said, after the Great Wall was developed further, I started developing the Great Wall in 76. And um, I painted the first thousand feet in 76 with 80 young people and 10 artists. And, and as this piece continued, he said, let's, can you do this all over the city? I mean, of course it was crazy idea, but I didn't realize how hard it was to do. Uh, but we revived in 1988, a program called Neighborhood Pride, Great Walls Unlimited. And then again, we hired 
over 100 artists. We produced 107 works in Chinese, the Chinese community, in the Black community, in the Latino community. And these were amazing works. And I would say that we probably have 40% of those left. And actually, given that we're showing you what we can do on the freeway, we could get those back. We could clean the paint off of them and bring them back. And I honestly think if we're listening, we're interested in uh, cultural democracy in the city of LA, we should do that. We should bring these works back on the street by all of these different artists. And they can, especially when you're, you're talking about the, the, the technical uh, things Spark has, to, has, has uh, created and Spark has gone, it's changed with the times. You now have a whole digital, we have a couple of photos of, of Spark. Tell us about Spark. Now, did that come about some, uh, somehow because of, of so much censorship when you were doing the other murals? Was there censorship and it made you create Spark? What gave you the Spark to create, co-found Spark, basically? Here's the building in Venice. Right. Well, so yes, this is, a, these are teams of artists that are looking at designs on the, in our collaborative group. The next generation, the next generation, you're, 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 you're creating them. Absolutely, this is in the lab. We, we um, the Spark was created because um, I wanted to bring, there was no way a structure, for example, the very first donation I got was from the, um, the great Zubin Mehta. Oh, wow. He came to the, I was in the old swim stadium in an auditorium there and running citywide. And really literally young people were running around with the paints and the bands and all of that, that I had worked with in the streets of LA, East LA. And he said, well, I, I wanna go out and see these murals. He said, I've been hearing about them and reading about them in the paper. I said, okay. So, so we, we went downstairs. I hardly knew who he was. I didn't know anything about Zubin Mehta. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> who is this man? <laughs> I realized I'm so, so naive, so I, and, he had, and, he, and he had a limo and he said, let's go. I said, uh, no, we can't go in the limo. I said, here's my little truck. So we got in my Toyota truck. I said, we can't go in the limo to where the murals are. So we went around town and he made a donation. And I realized I didn't have any way to receive the donation because we were oh, city, right? Right, right. So, <clears throat> And at the same time, um, the CETA program had begun, the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, which was for overeducated and under, under, underpaid and underemployed in the 1970s. So in 76 and 77, um, we received a grant to hire artists at what they called plumber's wages. I mean, literally plumber's wages are better than we got. But <laughs> yes, I'm sure. <laughs> We got um, a small stipends and these stipends were really helpful in giving people basic living. And, and then we set about uh, with my two partners, two women who were feminist and you know, uh, Donna Deitch, who was really interested in creating a, a major film, uh, which was the first great lesbian love story, Desert of the Heart. And Christina Schlesinger, who was Arthur Schlesinger's daughter, the great historian, so I had pretty cool partners. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and we, we developed the organization. And again, we had little knowledge about how to begin one, um, but that was how we started looking for a, a vehicle, a structure in which these kinds of works that might not be supported by the mainstream could be supported. And the Great Wall was one of your early projects, which is very interesting because I understand you were hired by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to spruce up what is basically a ditch. I know it's a flood canal, but it's a ditch in San Fernando Valley. And they said, make it pretty. I mean, <laughs> come on. And you did. But how did that come about? And the, well, actually, the kids call it the sewer. <laughs> we painted in the sewer. <laughs> oh, it was pretty terrible down there. Uh, well, they, uh, they, were, they were interested in us, you know, doing a segment of this area. And because, you know, when they got all done with the concreting of the LA River, which went on from the uh, early 30s, and really, literally, they concreted all the arroyos of Los Angeles to control the floods. And when they were done, they looked around and unlike God, they didn't say, oh, this is good. 
<laughs> they went, oh my God. <laughs> Look what we've done, right? We have dirt belts on either side of the river. We've divided up communities. We have a blight. And so this was an attempt at trying to, you know, inc improve those conditions. Was this the first, we have some wonderful photos. Was this the first time, look at, look at you were a baby. I know some of these pictures, I'm really quite young. I mean, this is, that's a, a Mrs. Arciaga um, and the Chavez Ravine image. She's railing against the, uh, the police who are carrying her off out of, 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 of Chavez Ravine. And, 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 and the yeah. young people painting, did you get these like you did the, uh, the other murals that you, when you were working on them? You, you kind of took them from the community where they art students? What, what the young people? Uh, the first segment, the first group were all juvenile justice kids. They had to have been arrested once. Or as the kids said, crime pays. <laughs> 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 they were criminals. They had to have been uh, arrested for a program uh, through um, a, a recidivism program. And so we had to track whether they went back to jail and stuff like that. And, and then later it was what they called a summer programs for disadvantaged, culture, they said culturally disadvantaged youth. Oh, how, wow. That's what they were called, wow. culturally disadvantaged. And later they changed it to economic, uh, economically disadvantaged. So we got to hire, we hired kids who were in poverty status, which was incredibly low amount of income something like $10,000 a month in their family households. So we gave them jobs. And actually it had a great impact on the economy of the region because we hired hundreds of kids. And today we're still in touch with many of those kids who are going to I'm be- sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Those were life-changing uh, uh, moments for, for these young people. How, how long is the Great Wall? It's a half a mile. And how do people see it? How can they go visit it and see it? And uh, is, 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 how do they view it? They're, they're viewing it is there's a bike trail along the top, which is part of what the Army Corps of Engineers developed when we were doing the planning for the, the, the segment of the mural. So there's a bike trail and a walking trail. And we're working right now. Uh, and this summer, we will have a lighting ceremony because we're lighting up the entire mural. Oh, wow. So Fantastic. Was well, that's going to be fabulous to be able to walk down the, the, the trail and see the mural at night. Oh, wow. That'll be and, amazing. And with the, with the support of the Mellon Foundation, which has been this kind of miracle gift, we are extending the Great Wall to bring it to the present. So it'll move another half mile. Uh, right now, in the next two years, we'll be doing the designing work the conceptualization, which is the hardest part. How do you interpret the 60s? How do you interpret the 70s? How do you talk about, particularly in this climate and this time, that historical narrative? Yes, yes. And are, you sure, are you sure you can do it in two years, Judy? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm not sure, but you're gonna give it a good try. And I, I know it's like, we at the point that we're dealing with white supremacist monuments across this country, the Great Wall stands as a model for the opposite of that. That's something directly a monument to the stories of the people of color of Los Angeles, to the working class of Los Angeles, to those who built the city who are little, little recognized uh, for their contributions. So with that, it's joyous work. It's really joyous work. And I think that's going to give us a lot of energy. And there's wonderful young people alongside of me. And all this work and designing will take place at Spark with your team and... and... Yes, and the lab and our digital lab. And then eventually we're, we're looking for a... Anybody have a airplane hangar we can use? We're going to paint it inside, we think. It's going to be the very uh -huh. first time we're going to maybe have a bathroom and water and sinks and not wow, have to you're be getting in. fancy in your old age i know i gotta have a bathroom <laughs> i gotta have santa monica, uh, santa monica airport i'll bet you they have one well you're that's kidding. that's it we need a we need an airplane hangar and so we can paint indoors and actually have a maybe air conditioning you know it's like 117 degrees in the valley right wow 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 
let's let's talk about little Judith Francisca Baca growing up in Watts. Uh, you grew up in an all-female household. Your mom, uh, Hortensia, we have a lovely photo of her here. I love that photo. Yes, that's my little brother born. This is 1953. Look at that old car. The best. And how about your you had two, your mom, two tias, and your grandmother, Francisca, your namesake there, who was yeah. a curandera. Yes. She, she greatly influenced you, yes? Absolutely. Tell me about her. Did she look at my hair? She did my hair. Um, my grandmother was, uh, Francisca was, uh, uh, I tried to trace her um, her roots and she's she was from um, Chihuahua, uh, from uh, born in Jimenez, uh, Chihuahua, and actually the same town that uh, Siqueiros is from. So people, people say, hey, this might be in the water. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Francisca was, um, uh, my mother was a single mother and uh, I, I ended up uh, being raised by my tia Rita and my, my aunt Delia who was uh, uh, educatively handicapped because um, uh, she was delivered by uh, doctors in, in this little town in Colorado where she was born with forceps and they damaged her brain. Oh, yes. So she was always a child, but she was a big child and my best friend. So with, when I couldn't reach something in the upper shelves, Delia would put me up there to get the candy, right? <laughs> so I grew up with her and it was a great uh, lesson in compassion. My, my Aunt Rita is a ranchera singer, just amazing singer. Wow. And Hortensia, who was this practical, beautiful, smart woman who worked and supported all of us in this little one bedroom house. And I lived there until I was uh, seven. Uh, and when my mother married an Italian and the whole world changed and we moved to Pacoima. And um, I spent the rest of my life growing up uh, till about 18 or 19 um, in Pacoima. And so that was sort of the story of my, my, my grandmother, however, used to see people and help them. They would come to see her and uh, she would say, well, what? And she'd make, make me go, go outside and I would climb a tree and sit in the back, sit in the backyard on, in the tree. There was not room for all of us in the little house, right? So I'd sit out there in the tree. And when they would leave, I'd come down and she'd say, what was wrong? With, what do you think was wrong with Mrs. Garcia? And I said, well, her husband has a girlfriend and she's unhappy. <laughs> you, you were the, the cheese man on the family. Oh yeah. my gosh. That's how I learned to watch how people were reacting. and. I think that was a great lesson in compassion and learning how what people were suffering and and observing observing yeah. and and and, uh, and storing that away. Um, your first uh, 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 what uh, exposure to art and I've heard this before, including from Carlos Almanas, was in church. Yes, in church and and in your case also the Watts Towers were so you you say you always wanted to paint you always wanted to draw but when did that really start and how? I think it started when I went to elementary school. So I was transferred. You know, I came out of Watts and this household uh, of uh, you know sort of loving household of these women and and my father, my stepfather was very uh, kind of much more rigid guy and much more. Um, he was a kind of father figure, a patriarch, and he believed that my mother shouldn't work. And, um, you know, he sort of sat down the letter of the law. Uh, I, I remember him being very upset that I couldn't tie my shoes and I was seven, right? <laughs> How could this girl grow to this age and she can't tie her shoes? Well, it turns out that I'm a little bit dyslexic. I mean, like I, I see things backwards, you know, sometimes, and which is useful, you know, in, in art, right? <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> they think it was a creative choice where it was just purely by accident, right? <laughs> right, right. And uh, so um, I went to school and um, English, I was, it was, English was then forced and we spoke Spanish in the house. And when he was there, it was like, he didn't want us speaking Spanish. So I went into school kind of stumbling in English and feeling um, like I didn't want to speak publicly and being really traumatized for the change. So this very smart teacher 
we got to hear it for really smart teachers, right? This kindergarten teacher. She said, here, take these little tin cans of temper color and newsprint and paint. So she sent me aside and I painted and painted until I could talk about the pieces I was painting. Wow. You created your own world. Yes. And I, and I think she was, I, her, her name was Mrs. Burton. I've never forgot her. Yeah. In fact, they, they've now named um, one of the buildings at Haddon Avenue Elementary School for Mrs. Burton. You know, I think we, I had Miss Leonard, you know, at that age, you don't know what the hell is going on and you're, you're, you're feeling this and feeling that or whatever. And there's that one teacher who senses that, I think, and they make you feel comfortable. They make you feel okay. And, and you, I can see her clearly. I'm sure you can see Miss Burton clearly. Of course, there's only about three of those out of the 500 we have as we go through school. That's the bad news. You know? uh, but but you tell you're not not you don't you you teach beautifully. I've, I've I've watched you. I've watched you. One of the other things uh, uh, that your your grandmother, who obviously you loved greatly, what well, you loved all those wonderful ladies, was your sense. Uh, she influenced your sense of indigenous Chicano culture. Yes. How so? And how did that reflect in your work? I'm sure we see it in your work today. Uh, yes, I think, you know, um, the newest piece I just finish, finished, which will be in this retrospective, um, which is called When God Was Woman, is really about that ancient spirituality of women. And the like my grandmother, for example, I didn't know what was not Catholic and what was Catholic, you know what I mean? There were, there were things, practices that she carried out and stories that she told that I didn't know were not Catholic. For example, she told us the story of her brother being taken by the federal troops during the revolution. And it was the revolution that drove them across the border. Otherwise they probably wouldn't have left. My grandfather had a ranch in Chihuahua and um, they took, she, they, her family took St. Anthony and hung him upside down in the closet. <laughs> And they oh, said, right. you have to stay there hanging on a rope until you bring our brother back, right? Wow. So I don't think that was Catholic. Right? I don't know, because I've heard like, if you lose something, you put some other saint in the mud head first. I mean, I, 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 I've heard that too. I don't, I don't really know, but I, it might be Catholic. I don't know. Or the amuleta. I don't know what was around. I, everybody had scapulas, but I had an amuleta. I don't know what was in it. <laughs> Could have been chicken feet or something, you know, I don't know. Well, whatever it is, it served you very, very well, you know. The other part was dreams. Every day started with, what did you dream? With my what, your, your grandmother would ask you what you dreamed? So I started learning to tell my, to remember dreams and to understand that dreams could be prophetic and that they could give you information about how to live your day. I believe that. I believe that. So then why did that wonderful thing be given to us and then make it so that we never remember our dreams? And what the hell good was it? <laughs> you know, because most of the time, you or even if you do, when you first get up three hours later, you go to tell a friend about it and it's gone. Yeah, I think it's a practice. You know, there's certain cultures that practice. Like this, there's a Samoan dreaming technique, right? Um, there are various cultures that do that. I, I I'd really like to spend more time on, you know, practicing, practicing dreaming. Uh, and the mural that I just finished is really a lot about dreams of a whole workshop of women I worked with, all of us recording our dreams. I think that'd be fascinating because they also say you work out your problems in your dreams. Unfortunately, if you work it out and you wake up and you forget it, then you're right back where you were. I, I when we lost our beautiful Diane Rodriguez, I, within two days, I dreamed her three nights in a row. And it was like a movie. I mean, it was scene to scene, full, beginning to end. And each one had a very specific message. And it was very clear. And I remembered it vividly. Now, not so much, but I did at the time. And I, and yet I, when I lost Carlos, I think I've dreamed him once in, and he died in 89. I think I've dreamed him once, but, but, Diane came three nights in a row, right away. Well, she was coming back. She was yeah. coming back to send you a message. 
Yeah, and they were clear. And one of them was actually a message for her mother. Really? I remember she said something to me. And when I remember when I woke the next day, I thought that wasn't for me. It was really for her. That she wanted me like to tell her mother or pass it to her mother. It was, and it was so vivid. It was like watching a Technicolor movie. Yeah. Well, my, the, the story that I like to tell about dreaming is that <clears throat> one of my mentors was a Russian Jewish woman from uh, Odessa and communist. And she was pretty much anti-religion, right? And I think she was even a Stalinist, you know, back in the day, people, before we all discovered what Stalin, who Stalin was. Right. And uh, Minna was actually a wave of the first artists that worked on, on social justice issues like, you know, the decent hourly wage and social security and, you know, uh, all those kinds of things that people had to fight for in America to have a decent way of living, right? So Minna uh, came to work at Spark because she had lost her leg. And I offered her a studio space with younger people to help her. And she was a printmaker, just consummate printmaker. And um, uh, I started building this house in the canals. My cousins were building it, my uncle was building it. And um, as I was building, she came to the site and she said, oh, Judy, you're building a house I'll never get to see the upper floors in. I said, oh, that's right, Minna, you'll never be able to climb with one leg, right? She called her prosthesis, Charlie, wave a ton, right? And, uh, yeah, in those days, yeah, sure. They wait a ton. And so when she was dying, I said to her, Minna, um, I was with her the whole time. And she said, I said, if when you die and you get to the other side, what will happen? And she said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> I said, <laughs> it was just completely devastating to me. I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, well, if it's not the truth, will you come back and tell me, please? And she said, okay, I promise, right? So it wasn't that long after she died that I had a dream that was kind of like almost waking sleep early in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there was Minna and she was on the staircase in my house about midway up. And I said to her, I said, Minna, what are you doing on the stairs? I, like, how did you get up there, right? And she said, she looked at me kind of disgusted because <laughs> she was annoyed by the stairs, right? <laughs> And she turned to me and she had told me before about my work and what it meant. And she said to me, Harbinger, Harbinger. So I got out of bed and I got Harbinger. So I jumped out of bed and I looked it up in the dictionary. What, it's really a word from the thirties. I mean, it's not something commonly used but it was really her era. The Robin is a Harbinger of spring, right? And she told me that the works I did were prophetic, that they actually saw things and that I should pay attention, that that was the legacy of my grandmother, that the imagery often was a harbinger. She didn't use the word harbinger, but I should pay attention to what they might tell me and what they might forecast. So I knew it was her. So yes. I'm convinced she came. I'm my sure she did. My communist friend came. <laughs> yes. And, and went up those goddamn stairs that you had built. That's right. Is that cool? Yes. I mean, you have to take things like that seriously. How could you not? No, I, I think that was the, that convinced me, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. We have a beautiful lady waiting in the wings. I adore her. Um, you know, you talk about the murals. When she, I met her shortly after she arrived here in Los Angeles, <clears throat> and uh, and I said, "Well, you you have to you have to see the murals." And I actually met her at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. She jumped in my car, and we went all the way down Sunset Boulevard. And we saw all the murals in Boyle Heights and through East LA. We wound up at La Parrilla and we had the most wonderful day seeing the murals in LA to this yeah. new city. And she has done such incredible work at yeah. MOLA. Yes. 
taking it in brave new directions. And uh, I think she's spectacular. So uh, let's invite the president and CEO, Doctora. Ay, yeah, there she is. There she is. Hi, how are you? Hi, my friends. How, how are, are you? you? You look beautiful. I'm loving this. Do you remember that day when we saw the of mural? Of course, of course. That was unforgettable. It, very it was beautiful, a, very beautiful day. It was a good introduction. And Chris from Olvera Street, I forget his last name. He, he gave us a tour of the Cicados. Yeah, it was a good day. And now here you are with our beautiful Judy. Tell us, tell us about the retrospective. And we, first of all, if you have not been to MOLA, you're a bad person. We have a show a photo. I think we have a photo. It's a magnificent a museum, the Museum of Latin American Art. Look at that, in Long Beach. It's huge. And uh, uh, I'd like to hear, first of all, let's hear about why a retrospective of Judy, why you, there's, there's, there's many wonderful artists, but why did you feel it was important to, to look at Judy's work in this comprehensive way? From the moment that I arrived to LA uh, and our uh, different conversations, and I discovered the, the big wall, I realized that Judy was the one, she is, uh, is she kind of master? And I feel deeply compromised with, with all the performance that Judy made in her professional career. And in retrospective was the less that we can do in MOLA for an icon like, like Judy Baca. I mean, you, there you have a real artist with a strong, very, very compromised uh, trajectory. Uh, a real social worker, one of the main icon of American art, public art, without any question. So yes. the retrospective of Judy is, is for Mola is a huge honor, but also something that we should uh, let know to the work. I mean, more museums have, to, this, this exhibition is exhibition that definitely should travel because America have to know about the legacy of Judy Baca and his work with the community and in the work of Yuri as an educator, as a woman, a, a very a fighter woman, but fighter for social justice. I mean- Soldadera, she's, she's a soldadera. She's the one, she is, yeah, she's and, a and soldada. I, and I believe, I could be wrong, but this is the, the really first comprehensive retrospective, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, Memorias de Nuestra Tierra, yeah. He's the first one, incredible, no? Yes. It's, it's amazing that it, 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 yeah. it hadn't happened before. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Tell yeah. Me, Judy, how do you feel about this? I mean, how, 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 how this has to be, I mean, I'm saying the, the hitting the wall and then this retrospective, they're honoring you at the gala in November and you're, and you're alive to see it. You haven't croaked. <laughs> That's the good news. And the good news is that I'm not dead yet, right? Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm first, let me just say, it's been a great pleasure to, work with Dr. Ramos and to, to have the support of MOLA. It's a, a beautiful space. And, uh, and I really didn't have a clue um, as they, when they began how this would work. I mean, first of all, it feels like I've been 20 different people in my life, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's like I'm my little 20 year old self and the first images that I made. And so the, the curation for, for um, uh, Alessandra and, um, Gabriela from MOLA, the yeah. two curators, Alessandra Moctezuma, and the, the, the amazing work they did to select the work, um, and also my archivist, Pilar Castillo, uh, I thought, what are they doing? This was crazy. These pieces don't fit together. This is nuts. I, I don't know. This is going to be the weirdest show I've ever seen, right? And what happened was that they've created a thread through all the work, and I actually, in the last couple of days I've seen it for the first time myself. It's, all, it's already hung because it opens very soon. Is it already right. finished, uh, hung? Not quite, but almost. Right? Almost, almost. Yeah, what, we uh, open in, in July 10 is the official opening, open to the public in July 11, uh, but it's almost done. It's a very complex exhibition because is uh, in the case of Yuri, we talk about uh, projects, mural projects. Yeah. So every drawing, every I mean, and every every mural is a huge history. 
she's a storyteller, a visionary yeah. storyteller. So now that I listen the history with the grandmother, I understand a lot of things that's finished. The yes. connection with, with the amazing work that you've been doing during the whole life. It's not about painting um, or a sculpture. No, it's about a life process. It's a memory of life process of the higher conscious. So um, something to see is unique. It's a unique memory show. And, and you know, Kira, it, uh, the Frank Romero retrospective was amazing. I, I've mm -hmm. known Frank forever and I know his work yeah. and I went there and it was like I discovered a whole other person. It was, it was absolutely magnificent. So I'm saying, I don't think people, you know, they think a retrospective, you pick 50 pieces and you hang them up on the wall. I mean, to choose, you have to, you're creating a story yourself. You're creating a story yourself with the work and what it is you want the people to get from it emotionally, you know, uh, uh, um, as we talked about, those things are, are living pieces and, and they're visceral when you hit them. So tell us about that process. How does, does some of it evolve as you're looking at the pieces? Oh, let's use this. And some of it must come as you discover the work, is that so or, or not? I assume. Of course, the curatorial work is, is about that, about the, how they made the connection. In, obviously in conversation with, with the artist, Alexandra knows very well uh, Judy's work and Gabriela is an extraordinary Latin American and Latina uh, creator. So they know very well how to handle the, the situation, but was extremely complex because I tell you, in the case of Judy, it's about archive. A lot of information, a lot of uh, situations in, in Judy's life, um, how you select and, and make something that is understandable for the public in, in a gallery space, in a museum space. Yes, uh, that's part of the problem because I think one of the reasons there hasn't been more major shows is like, how do you deal with muralism in a box, in a space, right? And, uh, and as I said, it's a revelation to me as I see the thread that runs through the work and the consistency of a point of view that they were able to, to put forward in the imagery. So I, I'm like so grateful that I'm learning myself all about what I've been doing. <laughs> I'm sure that's true, right? Cause you're just doing the work. You're doing the work, you're doing the work. And then suddenly somebody puts in a way that you're like, I had no idea. I mean, really, it's like when I do research for these things, everyone on, on the show is, so far has been a good friend and I know them really well. I know all about them. And as I'm doing the research, I'm like, oh my God, it's, it's a whole other ball game when you put it all together and you, and you see what that person has accomplished. Even in Judy's case, I thought, oh my God, we're gonna have to do a mini series. How am I gonna do everything that this woman has done? So that must've been your feeling as you looked at work, you could have probably filled three more museums with uh, her work to tell her story. Yeah, no doubt, yeah. Actually, we, we, we take three galleries, the three major galleries of the museum, and we go to have an immersed uh, experience with Yuri murals, um, immersed three-dimensional experience with 3D, in 3D with Yuri murals in one of the galleries. So it's, it's something very special. It's a real experience and, and um, very, very complex. Uh, exhibition, as I told you, but we feel more that honor because finally you, you can see the history. You can see Yuri's performs in, in, in a general vision. She's overall of the life career until now. I hope that we can make the same in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it'd be wonderful if it traveled, but that's so complicated. I mean, look what Cheech has gone through with his collection. Traveling is, is forget raising the money to do it and having museums. It's it's to uh, to travel. This particular show might be very difficult, just logistically. No, well, logistically, but it's not impossible. Actually, we are in conversation with few museums. And we have good expectation. We don't can go there right now and talk about the different negotiation. But the idea is we have to, to make a crossover. It's no way that we don't can make a crossover with this body of work. Uh, because Yuri is, uh, uh, it, it, I mean, she's global. She lived here, but 
the, the, the things that, that she care about are global issues, it's no doubt. So it's not reason why other museums, professional museums, uh, became engaged with this exhibition and we can travel this. It's complex to travel, but it's not impossible. See, Julie, you're gonna be hitting the Carney circuit. <laughs> I think so, actually. And, uh, you know, the immersion gallery that uh, Dr. Loro, this was, uh, 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 Ramos was talking about is uh, pretty amazing because it, it will give you the sensation of the transformation of the river from a river to a concrete ditch, as you call it, or the sewer, and then the transformation of that into the mural. And it, it works with a central metaphor of a tattoo on the scar where the river once ran, which is the metaphor that drove the work from the beginning to the end. So I'm really excited about that. It's gonna be a way of seeing a mural that really is not seen in galleries. You know, it'll be like you're walking inside of the mural. And it's uh, July 11th through January uh, uh, 22. Yes. Yeah. All right, Abelardo, how are you? I'm doing well. This is a incredibly enriching conversation. I learned. So I much. thought so. But, I, I was. I thought it was fascinating. I thought it was very interesting. No, you always bring out the 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 true stories, the heartfelt stories, the the, the great perspectives. Dan, thank you so much, and thank you, Judy, and thank you, Lourdes. We have a question here from uh, Marietta Bernstorff. She's asking, Judy, how do you feel now that the gods of art have given you so many gifts? for your lifetime work? I, I, yes, Marietta is uh, um, referring to the fact that a number of shows are coming up. Um, and it, it is kind of amazing. It's like, you know, uh, largely ignored for so many years. And then suddenly uh, people are saying, let's look at this work, right? So the Getty is, uh, I'm working with the Getty and I'm working with uh, Mocha and also the Santa Fe Art Museum and um, the Phoenix Museum, there are all these things that are coming up. Yes, and it's like the gods have suddenly uh, blessed me. And I have to say, I am grateful that it's being done before I'm dead. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. I, I, can't, I think your, your Nana is at work here, your Abuelita, I think she's at work. I think right? she is. No, I do honestly think so, because it seems like all these steps have been sort of orchestrated. It's just so, you know, step by step. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful. And, and I'm also really aware of how many people, as we started to put the galleries together and the images, I can't find enough room to thank all the people who worked with me, right? The people who helped me do the work because all of my work has been collaborative in some way. There've been the youth, hundreds of youth at the Great Wall, right? You know many, many people in the Central American community when I was telling a story that was not my own, right? So I, I've had the gifts of being able to be in proximity to people who could tell me their deepest and most heartfelt histories and stories that then I could record visually. So hooray, I get to share it. Isn't that amazing? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Brilliant. Truly amazing. Another question here from Gina Leon. She's asking, what has it been like for you in terms of processing the retrospective and seeing your body of work all pieced together? That's been quite an, that has been a really amazing experience. And I think the, the, the best way to describe it as I was trying to describe before is that one, I've met all these wonderful people that I'm working with and uh, Dr. Ramos among them. and. Uh, people from her board and um, the, the curators and the, and the workers at, at MOLA. It's a huge amount of work, huge. And um, so there's been that great gift. Um, but the other part of it has been the, the insight or the teaching that it's giving me. I am learning something that I don't know. I'm learning the importance again of the work. I knew what I was doing was I had to do it. I had passion about it. I knew that it was, it, it was very significant in the 1980s to talk about this migration of people from Central America. And as, a, you know, doing the migration of the golden people as people were leaving El Salvador and as they were leaving their countries because of the, of the, the conditions there. 
as they are leaving Mexico because of the conditions there and Honduras and all that. I knew that story was really, really important to tell. Um, but I am understanding again, how important, how important it is into the relationship of larger worldview and the curators are helping me see it. It's sort of like yeah. somebody there telling a story that now I'm a participant in. That's fantastic. Uh, Dr. Ramos, uh, tell us how you gave a little bit of a, of a explanation of how you chose Judy, but what was the final decision as to inviting her to have this retrospective? The final decision is attached at Mola is in the process of contextualize the best values of Chicano artists and Latinx artists um, attached to the mission of, of Latin American art. And uh, we have an exhibition committee that usually revise uh, the different theses and proposals that we have in place as part of the strategic planning of the institution and the mission of the institution. And we realized that uh, we have to do Judy Vaca show, that she's, we don't can believe that Judy don't have a retrospective before. How is that possible? Yeah. Because we are in the rescue process of, of the value of women in art. So it, we don't come moving forward without a, an exhibition of, of Judy. So it's, a, it's, it's a, an ethical decision and it's a moral decision of the institution to moving forward and make possible the show um, with Judy and uh, have to be a retrospective. We ju just don't want a, a show, we want a retrospective because we know from the beginning the complexity of the body of work of Judy and it's not, there's no way that we can just make just a piece. We have to do an, an overall, tell the story. That was the purpose of this show. Well, thank you. Yeah, well, I uh, both on Zoom and on Facebook, I uh, included Mola's ORG so you could get more information about the show. Um, we have uh, a few comments here, a lot of fans. We have Kenneth Gaines, uh, Ola from uh, Long Beach. Are there two Mola docents? We have uh, Rachel Delgado from San Antonio, Texas, Eliseo Tenorio from Boyle Heights. Um, let's see. Kenneth Gaines, Judy, you are awesome. Very few people are so consistently committed to the work of serving, helping, and creating, educating, demonstrating, and giving love. That's fantastic. On Facebook, we had quite a few viewers as well, all sending some saludos. Rafa Solorzano from Atlanta, Georgia. Bravo, Judy Baca, for all your achievements. Patricia Perez, saludos to Judy Baca. Looking forward to her MOLA show. Mari Riddle from Grand Performances. Bring the works back on the street. It's possible. Thanks for your passion and vision, Judy Baca. Mar Margaret Limon, saludos to Judy, recalling our wonderful travels to Cuba. Great to see you. <laughs> Except the part where I lost my wallet, Judy. You found it, I think. I forgot about that. I just remember those yeah, yeah. lovely drinks on that uh, uh, beautiful patio. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, Armando, I, go ahead. I Armando was, Duron, hi to you too. We uh, love Armando Duron. We love him. Hello, Armando. <laughs> and Diana T. Duran, Judy, you rock. And Alicia <laughs> Gonzalez, looking forward to the exhibit and, and saying that it, this must be seen in Latin America. So, yeah. ah, there you go. Doctora, that's Nick, yeah. verdad? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's really true. They still yeah, don't know anything. Yeah. They don't know anything about us still down there. They know that there's some people up here that speak Spanish, but they don't know anything about us. Yeah, <laughs> you are totally right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I, thank you to all. Go ahead, Dan. It's your. I, you I want to say, Judy. Judy, thank you so much, so much for uh, taking time to, to tonight to be with us and. Dr. Ramos, thank you so much. It means so much to have you here. And, and why I love doing these talks is because 
the stories about her grandmother, whatever, the, those stories are, 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 are now preserved forever because these remain in the archives, all these happy hours in the archives there at La Plaza on YouTube, they're there forever. So when we're long gone, people can come and study and they can, and they can say, where did Lourdes get that hat? It's fabulous. <laughs> I love that hat. Love great that. hat. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you both very, very much. I appreciate it. Nos vemos and I'll see you at the opening, I hope. I yeah. hope. And Dan, we, we need another trip to Cuba or elsewhere. Yeah, right? I agree. Yeah. Look at this, let's plan something. <laughs> Los tres grandes. Los tres grandes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Abelardo. Adios, everyone. Thank you, Adios, everybody. Thank Adios, you. Lourdes. Thank you. Adios, Judith. Adios, Dan. Everybody, just hang out for a little while longer. First of all, we'd like to thank, of course, Dan, Judy, and Lourdes. I'll let you know that La Plaza is planning on a, a trip to Cuba in November. Go to our website, lapca.org, and learn more about our travel to Havana uh, with Project Con Amor that's taking place in November. Oh, that, unfortunately, unfortunately, Judy is not allowed back on the island, and I'll tell you about. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you about that later. <laughs> uh, she'll have to go under a, a pseudonym or something. But yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure we could get her in. There, thank you. <laughs> and Dan will be back with us on uh, Friday, July 16th. Uh, and and we'll find out who the guest is. And I'll tell you right soon. now who the guest is: Abraham Quintanilla, uh, Selena's father. He's going to talk all about uh, his new memoir and all things Selena. That's our next guest, Abraham Quintanilla from uh, Corpus. We'll be zooming in. Great. Great. Thank you so Adios. much. Okay. Adios. I'll see you Adios. soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 All right. Uh, just all of you that are still hanging around, we want to thank AARP as our sponsor. AARP California just came on as our sponsor. Uh, great programs. They'll be with us uh, throughout the month of, of July and into, into August and September. Uh, thank you that all that joined us. Adriana M. Mendoza from AARP. Yes, it was a great conversation. Thank you. Um, let's see, coming up on En Casa con la Plaza next week, like I said, we are open tomorrow, Saturday from 12 to 5. We will be closed on Sunday, the 4th of July and also Monday, the 5th of July, and we're usually closed on Tuesday as well. So we'll see you at La Plaza uh, starting Wednesday on. We're open 12 to six, no reservations required. We do ask you to please wear your mask when you're inside on the first and second floor uh, in our galleries, including our, our tienda. And you could also go to la tienda, laplazatienda.org if you wanna shop from home. Uh, but we will have En Casa con la Plaza next week. Uh, let's see, on Wednesday, July 7th, Centro CSO, La Lucha Sigue, the fight continues. We'll have Carlos Montes, uh, I mean, one of the, the nationally immigrant rights, anti-war, pro-public education, Chicano activist, and a political prisoner. Carlos Montes will be with us along with Dupe Torres, uh, Alejandro Arellana, Centro Sol, CSO activist Sol Marquez, and Vietnam veteran turned activist Ray Andrade. They'll have a discussion on the continuing struggle for justicia on our community. That's next Wednesday, July 7th. And on uh, Friday, uh, some entertainment, Eastside Spanish guitar with Luis Viegas, Grammy nominated Luis Viegas, Friday, July 9th, uh, also sponsored by AARP California. And, um, and that's it. If you miss this, please, as Dan was saying, you could go to our YouTube page, catch all of our En Casa Con La Plaza programs, including Dan's happy hours with some incredible guests, Edward James Olmos. Um, too many that I can't even remember, but go to Al La Plaza, at La Plaza LA on YouTube, also Facebook at La Plaza LA, find out all the information about what's going on uh, in the galleries, in the, on our public programs, and then also lapca.org. You'll find out about uh, our exhibits, our upcoming gala, Y mucho, mucho, mucho más. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, ARP California, for sponsoring tonight's program. And uh, everybody take care, stay safe, y nos vemos muy pronto. Adios.